according to research from like the 1960s, kidney patients should avoid protein at all costs. When you did further digging, that advice was not even based on humans. This disease is disguised as a virtue in a way. I never, ever, ever want to go back to where I was. As humans, we tend to live for now and we can't see the problems right now. And your doctor says, no, you're doing fine with an HbA1c of seven. And you believe that and you walk away and only five years later, you see the problem and you can't go back and say, hey, but you said I was fine. We see so many people with not just increased rates of diabetes, cancer, heart disease, all of these conditions that are so affected by diet. And yet people working in the medical field probably spend less than a month studying nutrition. All right. Welcome. We've got Susan. Is it Susan Schneider, right? Correct. Here with us today. Suzanne Schneider. Yeah. Yeah. Suzanne, where are you uh, located? Out of curiosity. I'm in, in Bournemouth in the UK, but the accent is South African. South African. Yeah, I, I recognize it right away. My mother's South African. She's from Benoni, South, South Africa, Africa, if you know where that is. So it's, I was like, yeah, it's, it's nice. I like the accent. It's always fun to hear. So how long have you been in the UK? When did you immigrate? Sure. Gosh, about 10 years, but via Spain. So picked up some, a little bit of Spanish and then came to the UK. So yeah, this is home. Yeah. How, do you, how did you like Spain? It, uh, compare in terms of climate and I think culturally it was quite similar to South Africa in a way. We're quite an outdoor nation and I found that quite easy. Language, I really struggled. But yeah, acclimatizing to the UK weather was probably the biggest struggle for me. But I, I really, I like it here. No, I think this is home for me. What now. part of the UK? What, what part of the UK are you in? In an area called Dorset. So it's just south of London, about an hour and a half south of London. Okay. Okay. So you're right not far from the, the you're not far from the coast then, correct? Are you uh, right on the coast. In fact, I'm a beat I'm a street away from the beach. Oh, very nice. That's got to be one. Yeah. What, what part of South Africa were you in just out of curiosity? Oh gosh, there's an area called the Karoo which is very famous for sheep and goat farming and my parents were actually sheep and goat farmers. <laughs> oh, wow. So I'm okay. a, what they call a Karoo Karoo less. A um, Karoo, a Karoo. Um, I, yeah, I, I, yeah. So okay, is it near Cape Town? No, in fact, it is inland from there, but 12 hours drive from Cape Town. Oh, wow. So really in very semi, very arid uh, area of the country. But then moved to Cape Town when I was old enough to know better, young enough to still enjoy living in a city. <laughs> yeah, Cape Town Cape Town's a pretty city. It's very, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's got a really nice. nice. I, I'd been there. I've been there once and it was a really neat place. Okay, well, let's start. I guess we'll start talking Ooh. about stuff. You I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but you have an interest in diabetes, if I'm not mistaken. Ooh. Is that correct? Yes, a very personal one. Okay. You know, I was diagnosed when I was 11, so yeah, lived experience. So 11 is, I assume, a type one diabetic. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Um, gosh, I think I was the only kid in my school, and all the way through primary and high school. So uh, it was quite a quite a personal challenge. Anybody, um, you know, diagnosed at that age, you don't want to be different. So I had that demon to deal with. Uh, but yeah, so diagnosed at 11 and, oh gosh, I was quite a sporty kid and I had to figure out how I managed diabetes, but equally living away from home at boarding school was quite a challenge. So not only was I the only kid, but the adults around me didn't really know what was going on. So it was a big learning curve for me. Yeah, I can imagine. When you, so when you were diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, and this would have been, I don't know how many years ago, a few, a little while ago for sure. What were you told as far as how do you manage this now? Sure. I think the advice back then, I, similar to now really, is basically eat what you want. And then your, your insulin will, will cover it. But you also had to learn how to figure out the insulin. Because I was very active, I, I represented my province in a number of sports. So I had to figure out not only how to eat what I want and then just inject, but also inject so I'm not having a hypo in the middle of a swimming gala or a hockey match or a tennis match. So the guidance was, you know, test. Because at that stage, we only had finger prick testing. We didn't have CGMs. And I, to be honest, my parents couldn't afford to have six pre finger prick tests a day. 
So I would probably do, if I'm honest, maybe two a day and then adjust accordingly. And you'd probably be told, okay, you take X number of units for breakfast, X for lunch, X for dinner. You didn't really, you didn't really adjust, you know, you didn't really look at a blood glucose meeting, reading. If you did, then you might adjust. But it was literally on maybe 5, 5 and 10 in the evening and then you're long acting. So the science of numbers and adjusting according to numbers just wasn't going to happen. Not with that advice or testing twice a day. But yeah, looking in hindsight now, you think, heavens, how did I cope? Yeah. How often did you have hypoglycemic episodes? Did you have, have them frequently or no? Frequently. Certainly if I'm certainly when I was training for a big swimming baller, that was really hard because you'd train maybe two two hours in the afternoon and again maybe in the evening. So it was really hard to figure out A, what am I going to eat? Because everybody gets a standard lunch. And then you're going to do the training and then again in the evening. It was hard. I honestly, I would say certainly in, in primary school, often I would easily walk around with a bag of sweets as standard in my bag. And then certainly as I got older, I learned how to manage it more, but actually it was, this is hard to admit, but actually in a way, having a hyper was a nice excuse to be able to eat sweets legally, if that makes sense, because mm -hmm. you were you knew you weren't allowed to, but because you have a hypo, you can now eat a whole bag of sweets. And I think that was my, just my survival tactic, almost like treat as you go and face the repercussions later. Yeah, that's an interesting, because you met a whole bag of sweets, because a lot of people, when they have hypos, they become voraciously hungry. And it's just that you're trying to, it feels like you're trying to get yourself out of crisis. So you may even over consume yeah. them and then you exactly. probably didn't know it, but then you probably had hyperglycemia afterwards and up and down all the time for yeah. sure. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. What, did you ever eat biltong when you were a kid or did, was that part oh, of that? Yes. I love that when oh, I was, yes. it was one of the most wonderful, <laughs> delicious snacks in, in the world. Was, I yeah. That's part of being South African eating biltong. Interesting. I guess even as kids always had access to when we were home, obviously in boarding school, not, Food was quite restrictive in boarding school. In fact, you couldn't, you weren't allowed to keep food with you. I don't know why, but you weren't allowed to. But when we were home, obviously it was free access. And I think that was quite a healthy approach to food because things weren't off limit. But yeah, Biltong was definitely on there. Have you tried it? Hopefully. Yes, I have. And I, I, I quite enjoy it. Yeah, there's, uh, it's hard to get in the US, the quality that you have. And so there's a, there's a, uh, a guy up in South Dakota. Oh, that, that produces some nice biltong here for us. And so had some of those, it was, it was what, close to what I remember in South Africa. So you proceed, so you've got this, you can't really check your blood glucose very frequently. You're just guessing with the glucose, with the insulin and maybe you get it right. Maybe you don't. Were they checking your A1C periodically? Did you have hemoglobin A1C tested? I did. Time yeah. Time? Do you know, certainly yes. Back then we, I would every three months or so go for the eight, your check-in. But then if knowing what we know now about actually what does an HPA once you really tell you, that's an average, right? So even if you get a seven, which is still not a normal blood glucose reading, if you get this magic seven, that doesn't tell you how I feel at two in the morning or mm -hmm. eight o'clock at night. So even though you're being told, yeah, you're doing okay, actually three years down the line when you're having your first kind of eye check and you've got spots on your on your eye that you need treating, you wonder how the heck did that happen? Because I've been told I'm doing absolutely fine. Yeah, it, it was a real struggle because you're doing everything you can. Honestly, I, as someone who played a lot of sport, of course, maybe also because I'm female, I was very body conscious. So I thought I was doing the right thing, eating what I was told was a healthy diet, playing sport every single day of the week. And so when you go for a doctor's checkup and you then get told, actually, you're going to need laser treatment, it's devastating because you think, what am I doing wrong? What could I possibly do differently? Yeah, and, and you mentioned yeah. that the A1C is an average. So you could you could have a, well, it's high, but that's yes. ADA, like, oh, they think it's okay, they think it's okay there. But um, it could be on the back of very bunch of highs and lows and averaged out, whereas you're not having this steady number. You're having su significant highs, significant lows. And the, the significant highs may be leading to some of that retinal damage, that vessel damage in your eye. 
How old were you when you were told that you were having issues with your eye? Oh, gosh. I got my first pair of glasses when I was probably about, I would say about 14, 15. But that's not unusual because most people in my family wear glasses. But the first sort of laser treatment I had was probably about in my early 20s. And I've subsequently had, gosh, vitrectomies in both eyes. Yeah, so I've had quite a lot of repercussions on my eyes. And I think that's the one area that's really been almost my Achilles heel. But other than that, obviously, my kidneys, we might go on to that shortly. But my eyes were definitely the part that really stood out for me first as Mm -hmm. where I was going to experience problems. Yeah, it's because when they do the eye exam, it's like they've got this access to these very small vessels in the back of the retina that they can't access in other places. It's hard to see. And so it's a really, because if it's damaging the vessels in your eyes, it's damaging the vessels in your whole body. So it's yeah. just like a, it's like a window that's going on with the microcirculation. Yeah. And you'd mentioned, let's go on to the kidneys, because that's another common problem with diabetics is they end up having chronic renal insufficiency over time. Did you start to develop kidney issues as well? Do you know, that happened in, gosh, I would say in my 30s, I started having kidney issues. They started detecting that I was having protein, like protein in my urine. And eventually, still continuing with the same dietary advice, as in eat what you want, just inject. Mm -hmm. And so, unfortunately, that declined to a stage where I needed to be on dialysis for Mm -hmm. my kidney function. And I was unbelievably lucky. After three years of dialysis treatment, I then did receive an organ donation, but then I got a simultaneous kidney pancreas transplant. And I can tell you my life changed from night to day when I, had, when I was no longer type one, because I actually saw, I think when you're living in a situation, you put up with it because this is all you know. Mm-hmm. But once I, I had my new kidney and pancreas, I went, oh, so this is what healthy feels like. This is what it feels like not to have a hypo at two in the morning. This is what it feels like to have normal energy levels. Yeah, I had the transplant, gosh, about eight years ago, and it's unbelievable how that, honestly, that has changed my life because I think that's when I became aware and started to question, how the heck did I end up on this path? Because I thought I was fairly well informed. I'd studied nutrition I'd studied, uh, I studied marketing and consumer behavior. So I thought I knew what companies were telling me about what food is healthy. And yet here I was the recipient of a double organ transplant. So I did some further digging, some soul searching. Was that done back in South Africa as well? Uh, no. So I was fortunate enough to have that done in the UK. Uh, in Oxford is one of the, the world leading pancreas transplant centers of excellence and I just happened to be living near Oxford at the time. That's a, that's quite an operation. That's a that's a big deal there. I was getting yeah. a pancreas transplant. Yeah. So obviously you're on immunosuppressive drugs now. I would assume, correct? You have that's to be right. on that, yeah. that for life yeah. now. At what point? I assume there's a, a, a shift in dietary philosophy here at some point. At what point did that sort of tra- transpire? I think it was after my. My, my transplant, because that's when I went, how the heck did I end up here? And I, despite having a nutrition, a, a bachelor's in nutrition, I went, come on, I, this can't be. And that's when I thought, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into this more deeply. And that's when I went on to study a master's degree in nutrition and behavior. And I, my thesis was actually on this lived experience of being a person with type one on dialysis and the food restrictions and what is, what these, some of these restrictions, what is this really based on? And I think that's when I really started to question things and I thought this can't be right. When yeah. you, let me, so pardon, you said food restrictions because initially you said just eat what you want and inject insulin. So what sort of restrictions are you talking about at this point? Okay. So when you're on dialysis, you have, you have a very restrictive diet because you have to dialysis, limit the yeah. intake of Dialysis. phosphate, sodium. Okay. But then as a type one, you're also being told, okay, you shouldn't be eating all these carbohydrate rich foods, but eat a normal healthy diet, which comprises proteins, dairy, nuts, fruit and veg. But those products are all very high in potassium, phosphate, sodium. 
so what the hell do you eat? <laughs> do you know, are you, am I feeding my kidney diet or am I feeding my normal healthy diabetic diet when you're on dialysis? So it was really challenging. So what could you eat? What, what did you figure out you could eat at that point? It, it was really a lot of gray and gray foods. Honestly, just foods that weren't very nutritionally great. Protein certainly was a no, because according to research from like the 1960s, kidney patients should avoid protein at all costs. And you're like, when you did further digging, that advice was not even based on humans. Hmm. So yeah, I that kind of made me question a lot. And once I'd written this paper and I had a fantastic mentor and this person just said, you need to take this further. You, you, you've got a, a passion for the topic, but more people need to hear what's going on here. And what's interesting is part of that discuss, discovery of what the heck does people do people on dialysis eat? I realized that a lot of people with type 1 diabetes really suffer with eating disorders. And it's not something that's commonly known because most GPs aren't trained to look for eating disorders. But equally, as a type 1 you're encouraged to focus on what you eat and think about what you eat, measure what you eat, measure your glucose, measure your insulin. And so, of course, you're naturally going to become fixated on food. And the incidence of eating disorders in this patient group is a lot higher than what we realize. And so... When you mean insulin eating disorders, we classically think of things like bulimia, anorexia, maybe binge eating disorder. What type of eating yeah. disorders are you talking about? Specific. Certainly in type 1s, the incidence of binge eating and bulimia are far higher than in the normal population. Anorexia is not no different to the general population, but certainly binge eating and bulimia are the two that, that really stand out. Certainly within females, mostly, is higher than anything from 12 to about 35%. So depending on the demographic and the age group you're looking at, even for men, it's higher than the general population. So not as high as women, but still higher than the general population. And it's, I guess what's interesting is when you're diagnosed with type 1, of course you're going to become fixated. But equally, for those that are newly diagnosed, you may, when you start taking insulin, you may then start to pick up weight. And that is a sense of distress for some. But equally then when you're being told, okay, this is now the good diet and you're doing well, you're constantly being reinforced and praised for being so strict around food. And so then it's almost like an eating disorder can go un kind of noticed because this disease is disguised as a virtue in a way. But interestingly, there's quite a lot of research that's been done by some a really great lady by the name of Agnes Aiton. She's uh, based in Oxford and she's a psychiatrist, but also very interested in how nutrition affects eating disorders. And she's shown that specifically patients with anorexia who are offered a treatment approach using very low carbohydrate slash ketogenic approach has proven to be far more effective than just offering them refeeding on any basis, because we know that when people are in a state of ketosis, they are, they almost have a sense of much more kind of being in control. And they also have a sense of almost calm and I wouldn't go so far as to say euphoric, but they definitely have a much more sense of, yeah, let's just say having a sense of being in control. So if you then introduce refeeding, but through a ketogenic state, these patients seem to do a lot better because they feel like even though they're regaining weight, they're doing it in a way that they still manage to feel in control. So certainly for anorexics, that works well. But for patients with binge eating and bulimia, equally, we know when patients, people, doesn't have to be a patient, when people binge, they're not binging on broccoli. We tend to binge on highly ultra processed Nova 4 foods. And so those are the foods that tend to be higher in sugar. And obviously the ones that we shouldn't be binging on. And so if you can help people avoid those binges, so by helping them have more stable blood sugars, they tend to have less of those binge eating episodes 
And so in that way, you're just breaking the cycle by looking at the foods that they eat at the top. You can prevent some of the the repercussions further down the line. So yeah, there's some really good research that shows that actually what you eat can affect the eating disorder outcomes further down the line. Yeah, there's a nice uh, case series that Nick Norwitz and I helped him to organize on anorexics and using basically carnivore diets, keto carnivore diets to put their anorexia into remission because it's got a really high failure rate. Anorexia has a very high yes. failure rate. And, and I had talked to some of the patients that said that they were, when they were hospitalized, inpatient, they were just told to eat junk food. They were just giving them junk food just so they would eat something. And they would teach them, they would force them to eat junk food as part of their desensitization training. And, and it was just a really bizarre sort of approach. The other thing that when you mentioned, when you first go on insulin, a lot of times there's weight gain. So I, there's this concept of diabolemia where people will voluntarily yes. withhold insulin allowing their blood glucose to go very high so that they lose weight is that something that you see happening as well do you know that's really interesting because what is so unfortunate is that there are diabolemia isn't recognized as one of the official eating disorder categories in either the dsm-5 or the ism-11 and it is so unfortunate because it really is a distinct condition that occurs in type 1 diabetic patients. And so, yes, I think a lot of the time people, it's easy to just say, yeah, it's because of weight loss, because of body image that people have eating disorders. But I think it happens also because of just pure burnout. You just It's a 24-7, 365 condition. And if you are having these hypos and hypers every day, it just becomes too much. And you just think, stuff it. I'm just not going to, I just, I give up. But if you can help someone feel that they have a sense of control, I, I honestly, there is a lot of insight into the fact that if people feel that they have better diabetic control, their anxiety and depression is massively improved. And so that can also affect things like diabolemia. So I've definitely seen that in the literature reviews and things that I've done. But it's so unfortunate because diabolemia isn't just about weight. It's definitely about the anxiety, depression, and just overwhelming burden of managing diabetes. And if you can help someone feel more in control, then why wouldn't you? Yeah, you know, that, that is something I think a lot is under underappreciated is the average for you now with a pancreas, you don't have to think about this anymore. You're, you eat and your pancreas does what it's supposed to do. But with a di type 1 yeah. diabetic... They're constantly having to measure and check and every single time they eat, every time they exercise, every time they go to bed, every time they wake up, it is a round the clock, nonstop, continuous burden. And, yeah. and, and on top of that, you got to live your normal life as well. And stress, if you get in an argument, your blood glucose is going to go up and now you got to be. So it's a real, I can see where it gets real frustrating for the average person that's dealing with this. And it's a, it, it can be, obviously technology is improving. Now you have continue, you know, pumps and monitors and closed loop circuits and things like that to make it a little better for some of the people. But for the average person, it's, it's a huge stressor and, and it, and it can, I can see where you can get frustrated with that. There was a, you'd mentioned the Nova four category because that's the degrees of ultra processing. Somebody was asking about what is Nova four. That's the true ultra processed foods. Do you want to just, are you want, do you want to share the Nova classification? If you know it, I, I know the Nova four is the worst of the worst. It's like the <laughs> yeah. multi, you know, five ingredient chemical catastrophe foods, basically. Right. Yeah. So basically the, the scale was developed by a group of researchers. I think they're based in Brazil. They had figured out that depending on the degree of process, processing of food, your body's either better able to manage those foods or not. There are four categories, and the first of those is basically the raw ingredient. You pick the carrot, you can see the carrot. With a piece of salmon, you can see this is the raw ingredient. Yeah, this is an over one. This is an over one. So yeah. over two are basically these are the ingredients that you add to those, maybe like salt, pepper, olive oil, vinegar, whatever, mustard, herbs. And over four is basically a additive that kind of enhances that basic ingredient. Then Nova 3 is when you've had mild kind of processing, cutting, chopping, packaging food into even a if you made a fish pie, you could see, I can see pieces of fish. I can still identify what those foods are, 
but basically they contain ingredients from category one and two to make number three. So a homemade meal, for instance. Then category four would be foods that are not at all related to a real food product. So it might be salmon flavored crisps or a chocolate bar that says 80% cocoa. You can't see a relationship to a cocoa bean at all. But you can depend, those are generally foods that are basically foods with a barcode <laughs> that were created yeah. in a factory. They tend to have very long ingredient lists and probably additives that give them sh additional shelf life, but definitely have nothing to do with the original product that you could identify as a natural product that you can you would have in your house, basically. Yeah, yeah. so it's, yeah, like yeah. I'd seen like at least five ingredients and product ingredients that no one has in their cupboard. No one has mono and diglycerides in their cupboard. It's just anyway. Well, let yeah. me ask you. So you obviously type one diabetes, struggled with that for years. Have a combo pancreas kidney transplant. It's obviously changed your life significantly. You're no longer diabetic, which has got to be a huge relief. But you said you decided, hey, I'm going to change my diet regardless. I assume. Right. So how did that evolve? Do you know, I think once I got a glimpse into how I'd ended up where I did, and even though I now have a functioning pancreas, I never, ever want to go back to where I was before. And I want to do everything I can to make sure that I look after this new kidney and pancreas. And knowing what I know, I really want to make sure that I – I don't send my blood glucose into erratic. And for me, I just find that this is what works for me. And I, there is no one diet that works for everyone. Asking an, a person that lives in the Arctic to eat, eat a Mediterranean diet is not going to work. But I know that for me, eating a very low-carb keto diet works for me because I just feel that much better. And I, I don't have to deal with... I find even like now my, the, I, I still have to have retinopathy checks and I still have to have diabetic follow-up checks, even though I'm no longer diabetic. But I've certainly found that my healing has been amazing. I, I have my energy back. I work full-time. I study part-time. I, I, I wouldn't be able to do that if I didn't feel well. For me, certainly this diet works because I feel good on it. I feel I have mental clarity also. You've been doing that for around eight years since the transplant. Is that right? Yeah, I did. So it's sustainable. A lot of people, a lot of criticisms of low-carb diets, ketogenic diets, carnivore diets are not sustainable. We hear that all the time. And yet I continuously run into people that have been doing these things for decades. And I'm like, well, it sounds oh. sustainable to me. Um, you know, Sean, you, I'm, you, I'm yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm currently researching that very topic. So I'm currently doing a PhD on whether the ketogenic diet is helpful or harmful for, for people with type 1, but specifically looking at whether this impacts their eating disorder outcomes. And I've just received some of the – so the, the, the survey basically looks at, okay, if you're following this approach at point A, let's look at this two years later to see, are you still following a ketogenic approach? And if so, let's see what – if any of your relationship with food has changed, but equally, have you experienced any hypoglycemic events or any DKA? Because that's another reason why people say, no, don't do it. The survey re repeat is due to end at the end of Feb. So I'm still waiting for a couple more results. But so far out of the 36 participants, I've had 27 reply. None of them have had any hypoglycemic events that needed hospitalization. None of them have had DKA events. And all of those participants are still following that approach. And of the 27, 85% of them have been on this approach for more than three years. So I just want to go like, why do people with type one not get this even given as an option? Because are you, Basically, when I was diagnosed, my folks were given the information and I was taught this afterwards. And I know many type 1s are diagnosed at the age of 5, 6, or 7. And so they learn this information via their parents and they never get a refresher course. So what was taught to you at 11 is what you carry with you for the rest of your life. But you think, 
we also know more than what we did 20 years ago. So why are people not being taught that actually this is an option and nobody is forcing you to do it, but if you're really struggling, this could be a way for you to cope. Let me ask you a question when maybe you can't, maybe you can't decide this. You obviously type one diabetes, eat whatever you want. Didn't work very well. Ended up eye issues, kidney issues, pancreas transplant, having the surgery. If you could have gone back and, and, and maybe known what you know now about diet, would you have rather just had di- type one diabetes and treat it with a low carb diet? Or would you have rather had the, the pancreas transplant? I'm just wondering where you would fall on that. Wow. Do you know, Maya Angelou says, do the best you can until you know better. And then when you know better, do better. And at that time, that was the advice I had. And I thought I was doing the best I could. I would never want to blame the people around me because that's what they knew as that was the advice at the time. But knowing what I know now, I would want to do it differently because I feel honestly Dialysis is not something that I would wish on anyone. Honestly, it is. it was the worst experience of my life. You are tied to a machine three days a week. And you cannot, even the days that you aren't tied to a machine, you don't have a life. You can't even plan to go away for, with friends for a weekend because you don't know how you're going to feel. And I honestly, I, if I did know, I wish I could, I wish I could have said to myself, this is, there is a better way. But I, yeah, I hesitate to blame myself or the people around me because at that time, that was what they knew. If, yeah, no, yeah. fair enough. Yeah, yeah. goodness. That's got to be it. Like I said, you obviously were doing the best you thought you could do, given what you've known. And I think a lot of people are in that situation. And it's, to me, when I look at like the American Diabetes Association, still doling out the advice you largely got albeit they'll admit a low carb diet can be an option, but they don't really, it's like on the, on page six at the back. It's like, we don't really yeah. discuss this very wrong. much. So it's as someone who's lived this and has had a lot of skin in the game, underwent, you know, renal transplant and pancreas transplant. You've got to be, you've got, I'm sure you feel strongly about that. And if your advice for a new, newly diagnosed kid with type one diabetes or, or adult with late onset, a lot or something like that, or would it be, Hey, let's go low carb. Would that be your unqualified, unequivocal advice? I would honestly say yes, because you know what? What's so funny is that as humans, we tend to live for now and we can't see the problems right now because we say, oh, I'm feeling fine right now and I can just have a couple of jelly babies and I'll be fine. And I can, but the problem is, and very often when you, even when you're in a medical setting and your doctor says, no, you're doing fine with an HbA1c of seven and you believe that and you walk away and only five years later you see the problem and you can't go back and say, hey, but you said I was fine. So you, you want to say actually the best thing you can do for yourself now is invest in your future self because A, you want to feel good today so that you can play games and Keep up with your friends. And if you are going to play sport, then you're going to feel great. And I think the big thing is also, though, the people around you also need to be supportive because it's a lot to ask a kid to do this on their own. It's really important that the, the people around them also eat that way because it's it's hard for an 11-year-old to be told, here's your dinner and here's the dinner for everybody else. So I think... As much as I would certainly say the whole family needs to get on board. And even if you can, if you're going to go to friends' birthdays and things, it's equally important that those friends' parents understand why it's important that my child, please, needs to be given this option. Because I can tell you peer pressure is quite strong. And I certainly felt that as someone at boarding school, you just want to fit in, but you want to stand out for the reasons you choose not because some doctor has told you to eat differently. But if people around you are equally, if this is the way we eat, if all of us are eating healthily, then it's easy. You mentioned referencing being told you have hemoglobin A1C of seven and that's been, and you're given, hey, that's a good job because many of them are 10 and 12 and, and something much worse. The fact that we accept seven 
anything under seven is, is and, and in some cases, I, I recently saw the, the what, I can't remember, the American College of, of Surgeons, I think, uh, the American College of Physicians recommended between seven and eight even because mm-hmm. it's too hard. To, it's too hard to get it below seven. So let's just yeah, back it up to seven sure. and eight. Is you may be I'm I would imagine you're probably familiar with the work of Richard Bernstein and yes, his, he thinks that diabetics type one type two doesn't matter should have normal hemoglobin yeah. A1C or five or even fours yes and and routinely displays that what do you your A1C these days I would imagine is low fives upper fours I would imagine it's correct? insane four point six I tell you I've never had it's consistently been because I have a functioning pancreas. I'm hoping that definitely it will be around the 4.6 mark. But when I saw my first HbA1c of that, I, I, I couldn't believe it because I, I had never had an HbA1c of, of 4.6. You were saying about the the research of I think it was the I, I think it was the American Diabetes Association where they had shown the repercussions of after two years of having an HbA1c of for every year that you are at seven or above, these are the shortening of life, the effect on your eye function. It just shows, but like, and we're saying seven is okay. So even at seven, you're finding that it shortens your life by a hundred days every year. If your HbA1c is at seven. Yeah. So- they, <laughs> it's too hard for people to change their diet. That's what the, that's the mantra and seven's better than nine. And, but it's, it, it is, it's really shocking that when we know there is a diet that will generally allow for pretty much a normal blood glucose, and yet we still won't. So we don't want to deprive people. Deprive people of what? Life? Yeah. No. <laughs> it's crazy. It's hard though, Sean. I think what's – I don't think any doctor wants to be the mean one, the mean guy. If you can say, hey, that's fine, just eat that, uh, that patients will see you as the generous doctor. But actually, further down the line, are you really the generous doctor? If It's almost like sometimes – the, the parent who tells you no, the kid might not like you for that moment. But actually, if you're the one helping that person to live a better life, I it's hard because I, I don't think anybody wants to be seen as an unreasonable physician or doctor when you're providing guidance. But if you're not going to be around 10 years down the line, I may move to another town and I see a different physician and you might not see me have the problems I have with my eyes. Or my kidneys. Have you noticed uh, any improvement in your eyes since changing diet? I certainly haven't needed as much laser treatment. I've had, I think, one round of laser fairly shortly after the transplant. And I tend to think that's because my body was adjusting to the new sort of homeostatic environment. I still do have to go for regular checkups, but I've definitely found things have stabilized a lot since having a transplant i've talked this is the interesting thing because a lot of there's a lot of critics of low carb diets to include people that are critics of that in in the application of diabetes they'll say that you aren't actually reversing the disease you are just masking the symptoms by not or not by not consuming carbohydrates and my experience not my personal experience but my my experience with Patients many times is not only are they normalizing their blood glucose and coming off the different various diabetic medications, but also we're seeing a reversal of their kidney function, a reversal of their retinopathy, which is occurring. So clearly that to me shows that you're not just masking the symptoms, you're actually reversing the disease in many ways. Yeah. It's interesting. I think I definitely have found that because even even the, the strength of my glasses, now that you mention it, I actually needed a, a change in prescription, but actually because my strength had improved. So that doesn't just happen. And that was, but it did take some time for my eyes to find their new normal. And it, it must have been over a period of about two years before I got the new eye prescription. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's. I'm not sure. Are you familiar with a guy named Tim Noakes? He's another South yes, African. Yes, he's a fellow very, Sapphire. Yes. Yeah, he's a fellow <laughs> South Sapphire. Yeah, that has been a big advocate for low carb diets over in recent. Yeah, the same thing with himself. He discovered, I don't know, ten, twelve years ago that he was becoming diabetic because even though he'd been a marathon runner and an exercise physiologist, scientist, doctor, high carb didn't serve him well. 
Yeah. Do you do you get back down to South Africa? Have you been back in in recent times? And you know, not as much as I would love to. Obviously, during the time when I was on dialysis, I couldn't. So I not as much as I should or could or would love to. So no, the answer would probably be no. Not as much as I had been pre pre transplant. Yeah, I should go. I think next holiday. What do you eat? <laughs> what do you eat in a day? What is your daily? You said low carb, ketogenic style diet. What do you typically consume? I, what I do sixteen eight for me, I find that works quite well. Um, so a fasting window, basically, right? Yeah. Okay. It's insane, actually, how I was. I'm going to have to just admit, I used to be on the dark side, and I used to work at Pepsi <laughs> before I saw the light. You can you can blot that out if you don't want any brand names included. But being in the marketing industry, but even so, I was definitely told breakfast is that you need breakfast so that you can take your insulin so that you can run your day. And then obviously when I no longer had to take insulin, I also figured I don't really need this breakfast thing. I'm going to just see. I've read about the uh, fasting. Let me see if this works for me. And actually, I'm, I definitely, this is how I eat now. I've done it for about, I've done 16, 8 for about two years and I, this works for me. So I would start maybe with coffee in the morning and my first meal would probably be around, I would say one o'clock because I, I, I have a very busy morning and lunch would be probably maybe soup and probably some sort of protein, whatever I've had from the night before. And then dinner would be my main meal. So I'd have protein, veg and salad. Yeah. I tend to cook a lot so that I don't have to worry at lunchtime because I'm working full time, I have to be quite organized. And I suppose anybody would have to be if you want to eat healthily, you just have to organize your life. And I, I find that works for me because it removes the stress of thinking, okay, what am I going to have for lunch? And if my meeting runs over, what am I going to do? So because I'm organized, I remove that stress from my life. I don't, I don't tend to snack as much too, uh, I suppose, because I'm eating enough. Yeah, I would say I probably stop eating at about 8 p.m., depending on how the day is going. If I'm working late, then it, it might be later. But I'm not, I'm try, I guess because of my experience of having been on dialysis and really having a very rigid approach to food, I try to not be too rigid with myself in kind of time zones. And But I really do try and I do it because it makes me feel good. And I try not to become fixated on it. Yeah, I'm not sure if you're f familiar with the term orthorexia. Yeah, so that for those that might not be aware of it, but it is another condition that's not, it's not recognized within the kind of official DSM-5, ISM-11 diagnostic manuals. But it generally refers to a fixation of eating only biologically pure foods with a rigid avoidance of foods that are believed to be unhealthy. And while there's nothing wrong with eating healthy foods, the, when this becomes a problem is when it coincides with things like almost obsessive compulsive disorder and the same sort of characteristics of um, anorexia where you become so ritualistic about food and you avoid foods that it, it almost impacts your social life, your mental functioning of things. And I just want to make sure that when I follow an approach, it, it is healthy for me in terms of meeting with friends and family too. Yeah, I, it works for me and I make it work. If I eat a meal out with friends, I just choose foods that suit my way of eating. But I try not to restrict meeting with friends because, boy, I had three years of that. I don't, I don't need that <laughs> anymore. Let me ask you, obviously, at some point, kidneys failing on dialysis, living with the, the unpredictability and the, the, the discomfort of type 1 diabetes, hypos, hypers. Mm -hmm. What kind of impact did it have on your mental health? And do you feel that diet impacts mental health? Oh, certainly. I definitely feel mentally you were always anxious because you never knew when you were going to have a hypo. If you were even in a normal functioning job, you never know, do I have lunch now or do I have lunch after the meeting? Because you, you can't eat in the meeting. So you're anxious about managing just life. Even just, even mentally thinking, I think my, my clarity of thought wasn't 
the same. I certainly post transplant, I can, I definitely feel I have a different level of ability to focus and even playing sport, you feel a lot more secure that I, it's fine I'm enough on board. I can go for that 10 kilometer walk on the beach on a Saturday morning. Whereas before I would have to pack a whole backpack of stuff just in case. And then you pack insulin too, but then it's a hot day. So what do you do with your insulin? Just that anxiety around managing your life is totally removed. And sorry, what was the other bit about the mental impact? As in, Well, yeah. you'd mentioned that obviously it's very anxiety provoking when you don't know, hey, am I going to have a hypo and then I'm, I can't do what I want to do. But do you feel that like the type of nutrition we consume mm -hmm. impacts our mental health? It seems obvious, but some people say there's nothing to do with nutrition. It's all yeah. about trauma and you know, brain chemistry and whatever. But what are your thoughts on that? Oh, certainly there's a lot of research on just the impact of hypos and hypers, even in terms of longer term outcomes like dementia, the effect on it, certain parts of your brain that impact decision making. So there's a lot of research on that. But what I've personally experienced, I can say, I definitely feel it's, it's made an impact. So Yes, I would say what I eat definitely does. If I think back to how I felt eating, say, what I thought was a healthy breakfast, having, say, oats with bananas and a glass of juice for breakfast, I know that by 11, 10, 30, 11, I'd want something more to eat because of the way that those foods impact blood sugar. So, Again, you're having the anxiety of, okay, I've had breakfast. Why am I hungry? I'm going to a meeting. What do I do now? So just how it makes you feel physically. But then if you're having some sort of snack food in the middle of the afternoon, that impacts your focus. So for me, definitely, I, can, I feel that what I eat impacts my mental function, most definitely. Yeah, you wouldn't be alone in that, but it's, you may be familiar with work guys like Chris Palmer, George E, and some of the other folks at Metabolic Mind, I think, Institute or something along the lines, Metabolic Psychiatry, where they're showing that ketogenic diets in particular have been very helpful for putting depression, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder into remission fairly consistently, which I think is what I see clinically as well. And one of the major things I see when people adopt low carb ketogenic carnivore diets is they often will say that their mental health is much improved. And so mm -hmm. when we look around and we see so much mental health, mental health disorders, the prevalence has just gone up tremendously in the last really few decades, even the last few years. It's, I think I saw somebody say one in three young adults is now suffering from some sort of mental health disorder, which is just wow. an incredible the prevalence of that. Is just, it's just off the charts. Yeah. And it, it's likely that we're all eating all these, like you said, Nova 4, ultra processed, I was just say, yeah, yeah, in the U.S., it's like almost 70% of our diet is coming from that, which is just tragic. The U.K., not quite to that level. I'm sure the U.K. is probably yeah. close to 50%, though, if I'm not mistaken. We've got about five minutes left. Anything else you want to share before we go? And this has been wonderful. Thank you, by the way. I appreciate that. Gosh, I think the biggest thing I would say, if I could do a call to action, <laughs> this is my two minutes of action time, I really feel that every doctor – has to improve their knowledge of nutrition. We are in a space right now where we see so many people with not just increased rates of diabetes, cancer, heart disease, all of these conditions that are so affected by diet. And yet people working in the medical field probably spend less than a month studying nutrition. And how are you expecting someone to manage their health condition and you're trusting a drug to do this for them. And you're sending a type 1 diabetic patient home with insulin, which in the wrong dose can be deadly. And actually, if you're helping somebody actually manage their diet, you're giving them just a double, like double whammy. So you, I honestly feel that my biggest call to action would be please just up your knowledge about nutrition so that you can help people who do want to follow this approach. Because again, I'm not saying that the keto approach is for everyone. You have your free, you have freedom of choice, but if you know what you're doing, you can do this safely. And even if patients come and ask you for help, at least you can guide them safely so that they're not 
an answer and, and making a guesstimate. So as a physician, you're doing the right thing by just increasing your knowledge so that you can help people do this safely. And honestly, you would, I, I think people who are currently struggling with type 1 diabetes, who haven't even heard of this approach, would be grateful to know that there is a better way to live. Yeah, amen to that. <laughs> That's uh, that's wonderful information, Suzanne. Thank you so much for doing this and continued success. When are you doing your P you're getting your PhD? Well, your area of focus is going to be type one diabetes going forward. Is that the? That's right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So I've got two more years to go, but yeah, I feel just incredibly lucky because I've just been fortunate enough to meet people like yourself and connect with people like Dr. Ian Lake, who's a fellow person with type one. I'm interviewing him next week in a, in a, oh, in a few, right? in a couple of weeks. He's I think, amazing. Yes. Yeah. He's amazing, really. So I've just, yeah, I feel this is a very supportive community and I've met some wonderful people who've been able to guide me and even the, the people who've contributed to my research, the fact that they want to share their story because they just feel that sometimes when they go to a doctor's appointment, they don't get to share how they feel. Mm -hmm. And the fact that someone wants to listen and help, help bring this out. I think that was really wonderful, but I'm grateful to them for sharing their story with me so that I can hopefully help others. Thanks, thanks again, Susan. Appreciate it. Thanks for being here. I appreciate you too. Thanks, Sean.